Okay. So welcome everybody. Uh, um, Mahabha is a network of, um, of people, of Christians who are seeking to uh, love Muslims and to help Christians overcome pr any prejudice. We, we very much believe in building bridges and enabling people to connect. Um, I've, we've got people from the Mahabha network, and I think we have friends of uh, Karama Dan Muhammad Ajib this evening. We've also got people from Woking People of Faith. I'm the chair of Woking People of Faith in Woking, um, and we invited them to join as well. So wherever you've come from, you're very welcome. Maybe we should just check who's come the furthest virtually. I, I can see, see Jim is from Wales. <laughs> And Ted is from up north. I know those two, but who's come further than um, Nelson or way, uh, North what, Wales? Further than where? Where's the place we're furthest from? Oh, that's a good point. Where from Birmingham? Let's take Birmingham as the centre of the universe, where <laughs> uh, where Karamat is. So let's find out who's furthest away from where. Just just say where you've come from, just out of interest. Anyone? You said I'm from Nelson near Burnley. Nelson near Burnley. Ooh. I'm in Cardiff, uh, 100 miles away from Birmingham. <laughs> I'm from Peshawar. Who is that? Who is Peshawari Wala Gonta? Uh, Mehta. Oh, Mohammed Hassan. Yes. Good. Wonderful. I love your city. I wish I had a chaplik above. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, who else have we got? Rabina, where have you come from? I'm from Birmingham, just down the road. Just down the road. Okay. And Mirban Khan? Can't hear you, but um, anyway, welcome to everybody. Um, so just to housekeeping, uh, if you don't mind muting, that would be really helpful. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I will mute you. Um, but they, we will have, and I'll mute myself as well in a minute, I'm going to hand over to Karamat and Muhammad Ajib in a moment. Um, we're delighted to be able to host this call. There is a chat facility, and if you'd like to, yeah, thank you, Mirban. You've already done that and put your name, where you're from, so I, people can put where they're from in the chat, if you like, just to um, register that you're here. And also, if you, as you listen to Karamat and Muhammad Ajib in conversation, if, you, if questions occur to you, uh, then write them down. We're not going to stop the conversation and answer them immediately. But when it comes time to open up for questions, then, then, we can, then we can, we'll have some already. Um, so welcome to everybody. I'm delighted that... Um, my colleague Karamat, uh, is Dr. Karamat Iqbal, who has done a number of these conversations, is part of a small series that we've been running in Mahabha, and um, we're delighted that he's able to interview Muhammad Ajib. And I'm not going to steal any thunder. I'm not going to say why you're interviewing Muhammad Ajib in particular. I think that's your job, um, Karamat. So over to you, and I will now mute. Thanks, Phil. And a special welcome to Ajib Saab. I think it, it is said that role models play an important part in our lives, especially when one comes from a, a disadvantaged community, such as the Pakistani community. Role models help you to imagine and dream above yourself and above your immediate environment and circumstances. I was sent to England at the age of 12. So for me, meeting Sultan Mahmoud Hashmi, who was the first role model, that was quite a significant event. Mahmoud Hashmi was a journalist, he lived near us in Birmingham. His office was there. I met him about age 13, 14. 
and Muhammad Ajib CBE was the second such role model, especially as he came from near Kondor, where we have close family. We have never met in person, so my knowledge of him has been drawn from books, articles, videos, a few texts, and one or two phone conversations. So it is a pleasure to have this conversation with you this evening, sir, and an honor. So my first question is, so you were born in Chatro, within the subdivision of Jodhial in district Mirpur, sometimes in the late 1930s, 1938, I believe. Would you like to tell us about your childhood? Uh, yes, indeed. Before I do that, uh, I would like to say assalamu alaikum and good evening to all of you. And I'm really delighted to see you on uh, this video the first time, although we have, as you said rightly, we have talked for, uh, on the phone before. Um, I was born, as you say rightly, in the village of Chakro, which is uh, not far from the Dial, uh, it's about 10, 11 kilometers from the Dial. Uh, it's a village uh, which, in those days when I was born, um, people were quite poor, there were no jobs available. Even in those days, I remember that the people used to leave the village uh, in quest of uh, jobs either to Karachi, uh, the largest city in those days, and also which was the capital of Pakistan. Um, I mean, there was only one primary school uh, which uh, I went to, and hardly there were less, I think there were less than 100 children in those days, uh, the total number of children attending the school. Uh, there were two teachers um, for uh, primary school teaching. Uh, there were no basic facilities available in those days, no electricity, no water. We used to drink water from the River Jhelum, which um, uh, was not far from uh, other uh, small sub-village. Uh, hardly about a mile away. And uh, I remember going uh, to the river to fetch some water on donkey's back. Um, we used to have uh, a pair of oxen. We had a uh, small uh, land holding. My father was a mason. So he used to sort of uh, um, do some building work uh, in the village from time to time when people needed him. And we had um, uh, used that land for cultivating purposes. And um, uh, I think the, uh, the produce from that land was sufficient to keep us um, alive. By no by any standard, I mean, my family was uh, poor family, relatively poor. We were not sort of totally destitute for, we did not starve, but um, we could hardly manage. Uh, I had uh, one brother and two sisters. Uh, actually, I lost my mother when I was only about six. So uh, that kind of life was there, but um, there were also, uh, in those days, um, even now, I think that uh, to a greater extent is still uh, applicable, uh, that those who were uh, powerful, uh, belonging to large tribes or large brotheries or large caste, I think that they used to um, uh, have the power uh, and uh, one very vivid instance I remember when I was in the third class in the primary school, 
we were taken to um, near your village, probably Kando. In those days, there was no road uh, at all, but there was some kind of um, sort of a small track. And uh, the teacher, the headmaster told us that we must go to welcome the Maharaja. That was, I think, in 1946, to welcome him. And uh, we went there, I remember, we were asked to stand uh, on the side of the road and uh, we had a little bit of flex and uh, to wave. And when he came, I still remember his um, face. Uh, he was in Western desk. Uh, and uh, he, he had a Jeep, I can still remember. So we had to shout uh, Hari Singh Maharaja Kijaya or something like that. So uh, it was a typical uh, village life in those days in the state of uh, Jammu and Kashmir because we were living at the border. The other thing I remember that there were certain restrictions in the state we could not eat beef or uh, uh, things like that. And if uh, someone had slaughtered a cow or something, um, the police used to come, I remember, and uh, uh, arrest the people. So, but uh, I also remember the kind of social injustices, even at that age. And I used to think about these things very deeply, why it is so, why we are not all equal, why poor and the rich, why the powerful and the powerless. So these kind of thoughts in even those days used to cross my mind. So that's briefly the... Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, I think the life I uh, left behind in, in um, my village was similar. And uh, obviously village life, uh, uh, we walked everywhere and there was no running water and that kind of thing. And so when I came to England, one of the books that um, I um, uh, really liked reading, and I still occasionally read it, is um, called Cider with a Rosie. It is about a village in Gloucestershire, and mm -hmm. it's written by a famous writer called Laurie Lee. And Laurie Lee also wrote another book um, where he, uh, which he called as I walked out one midsummer morning, he was 19 and he uh, felt he had enough of the village life and he wanted to go. Uh, he ended up going to Spain, um, took him many, many days and, and weeks. And you did the same, I believe. I think at the age of 16, you, um, you got on a train to Karachi um, which in those days, I believe, was a two-day journey. Would you like to tell us about the journey and your time in Karachi? And I'm mm -hmm. particularly interested in you talking about justice and injustice and your awareness of it. I believe in Karachi, you stood up for poor people, poor factory workers. So give us a glimpse of Karachi, please. Well, as you say, I, I left home after the, uh, completing my matriculation from the Dial in those days. The only high school was in the Dial. And uh, we went, for example, to Mipa, was the center of the Punjab University. I, my father said, and I knew there was no job available in those days uh, for a boy who had just completed his matriculation. Um, and uh, if you didn't have any source, or you didn't know the, someone in the hierarchy of uh, you know, the, 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 the power structure, uh, political um, uh, structure. Um, so 
I chose to be my village. Uh, my uncle was uh, doing some construction work in Karachi and uh, uh, he was also a builder. So he said, come to Karachi. So it was my first experience to be my village and uh, travel about uh, nearly a thousand miles away and towards south in Karachi in those days. I, my father handed me over to one of his friends who were already driving rickshaw in Karachi. So he said, you go with him and he will look after you. We walked from my village to the old Mirpur city in those days, which is about 80 miles. And from there, I remember catching a bus to Jhelum. Uh, there, we stayed for a few hours, and uh, it was my first experience to see city, buses, and everything, for the first time in my life. And I was eagerly waiting for a train to arrive. And you know, I was very enthusiastic about seeing what kind of this this, this thing is going to be. So the train arrived at about, I remember, 11 o'clock uh, before midnight. And uh, he, my uh, father's friend, he bought tickets and uh, he said, just stand here on the platform because he said there will be Russian people who jump in and I'll help you. Anyway, when the train came and people rushed into jumping into the um, train and um, uh, I, I managed with his help to just he shoved me in and there were no seats so he just, I just stood um, for the whole night journey it was I think 24 hours as you said rightly and I arrived in Karachi after 24 hours. I was uh, obviously tired, but I, uh, I was uh, again um, uh, eagerly waiting to see um, the largest city in Pakistan, Karachi, in those days, uh, the capital of Pakistan. So uh, this man took me to his home, uh, had a wash, uh, shower. They fed me with uh, some kind of uh, meal. Uh, his son, who was of my age, I think that he accompanied me. And the first, the first day, he showed me uh, some central part of Karachi. And the next day, he uh, uh, he took me to my uncle's place. Uh, it was a shanty town uh, where he was living with his family. Um, uh, it was not a house; it was just uh, hut, um, just one large room. We had to sort of uh, manage to uh, sleep, or Louis' family and myself, and that. So, I, my uncle said that we were here uh, for further education, and I'll help you with some expenses, but uh, I'm not rich. But, Anyway, I can hardly manage to look after my family. You have to work um, during the week or whenever uh, you, you have the time. So he took me to the college, got the admission, but I said I can't afford full time, so I have to sort of go for uh, uh, evening uh, buses in those days that are available. Mm -hmm. and for the first uh, six months during the day, uh, I found um, some odd jobs laboring, um, which first time I, I had to do it. it was not very pleasant because Karachi being a very hot place compared uh, to where I came from north, it was very humid climate, but I had to, I had to sort of the work hard. Yes. Then I got a job in the textile mill uh, uh, in, in those days in industrial area of Karachi. And that's where uh, the incident 
uh, that took place, which you have already referred to, that uh, I was, uh, because I could read and write and in English and Urdu both, so they gave me a job uh, as a record keeper of uh, all the, the goods which were uh, uh, left in mill to be delivered to other suppliers or retailers or so what. And uh, there were other people, about eight or nine, working uh, in the same department. Uh, their job was to uh, load all the bales, which were very heavy. There were no cranes, and they had to sort of uh, lift it. Uh, their hands, physically, I thought it was uh, very uh, uh, tedious, sort of very sort of risky job anyway. So one day what happened that uh, one of the young men, um, he somehow the um, bail fell on him and uh, he died. Uh, I talked to the manager and he said, well, it's up to the uh, owner of the mill. So he will come and later on when he is there, then you people can talk to him. So I went, I remember going to his office uh, a very, he appeared to be very pious with long beard and he was very polite, but he said, look, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the uh, worker's fault, it's not, um, you know, I mean, we told them to be careful and not lift what they could not and all these kind of things, I think, you know, these excuses. But I said, well, look, what's happened, it's happened, but now I understand that uh, he is not a local man. He comes from Hazara, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, near Aptava. Yes. And uh, you know, his family, I mean, they depended on him. So could you help his son? They have some compensation. He was not very willing, although he would appear to be sympathetic. Then what I did anyway, I organized uh, the labor force there and uh, I said, well, look, we need to, or you need to first join the union. There was local unions. I uh, met, persuaded them to become the members. Once they were members, then I went to uh, discuss with the union man. And he raised this issue with the owner and then I think that it was a quite a big struggle. Uh, I asked the workers um, to go on strike. There was a strike for about a week. And eventually then, I think that the, with the helper trade union, the owner of the mill realized that uh, they're not going to um, keep quiet. And eventually they agreed to pay some compensation to the uh, parents of the disease. So that was my first sort of uh, uh, encounter um, with someone who was the employer and powerful person, and I being a poor boy coming from a very uh, backward rural village. But it was, I don't know, it was some kind of um, it was a feeling inside me which was driving me, which was forcing me to do something because I thought it was a, a very gross example of injustice. Uh, so uh, that was just what I tried to do and I succeeded and I, that, that gave me, you know, and very sort of, I was, you know, I got satisfaction that I have achieved something. Yes, yes, yes. And, and then after, after Karachi, your adventure was to continue. A few years later, you decided to go to England and ended up in Nottingham. Tell us about that and your life in a new country in the late 1950s. Mahmoud Hashmi once wrote about the particular situation of the educated immigrants who had come to the UK. And you were one such immigrant who had been educated and you were different from many others who, who had not the opportunity to go 
to school or college. And um, um, so tell us about Nottingham and your mm -hmm. unique um, uh, experience there. Before, before I do that, uh, I think that um, um, I, I must pay my uh, sincere tribute uh, to the late Mahmoud uh, Hajmi. He was a great writer. He was an intellectual person. I met him on several uh, occasions. Uh, actually, he wrote an article about me uh, when, uh, when I was elected as a provisional Lord Mayor. And later on, I think in 2000, also he wrote um, an article and uh, he sent it to me. I still have his hand written and in this article he wrote it. He was a great man anyway. So what, I mean, after doing my, um, completing my education in Karate, during that time, I had a friend from, uh, uh, from a village near Mipur city. But there were only, I think, uh, very few people in those days from Azad Kashmir who were uh, um, attending the educational institutions. And we became friends. His uh, elder brother uh, emigrated to uh, um, England in the early 50s. And um, he, his elder brother, then decided that uh, this young man should also uh, come to Britain. Uh, after he arrived in Britain, my friend, he wrote a letter to me saying, well, why don't you come? Uh, because I, am, I don't have any friends here. I don't know anyone. And um, why don't you come to England? And I said, what can I do there? He said, well, you come here and then uh, you can try to get a job like uh, other people. Uh, I said, I haven't got much money to uh, raise money. Well, how can I come? Anyway, he said, uh, uh, you know, if you come here, then uh, you can stay with me and uh, we will not, if, if you uh, don't have any job uh, for a while, then you will be living uh, on us three. So I went back to my village. I traveled by train and I uh, consulted my father. He said, uh, yes, but we haven't got the money. I said, father, well, how much you got money? <laughs> He said, uh, I've got hardly about 500 rupees and I needed uh, 1100 deposit and 1700 in those days rupees uh, for, for the um, airline fare. Yeah. So he managed to uh, borrow some money uh, from my two uncles. And uh, there was someone in the village who used to in those days lend uh, money but he used to charge some high interest. So he, he, he raised um, uh, the necessary amount which was required for me to travel to um, uh, Britain. So I came back to Karachi. Uh, I uh, got the passport ready. And then I think that another incident took place that I went to, in those days, it was a requirement for um, uh, people who wanted to come to Britain, there was no visa requirement or anything else. Uh, it was an open law uh, immigration policy of Britain in those days. But um, we had to have about five pounds from the State Bank of Pakistan just to uh, manage our travel from London to uh, any other city. I don't know why it was uh, mandatory. So, I went to apply. Uh, then after two, three days, I went and uh, I asked the clerk uh, uh, my application, have you considered? Oh, he said, yeah, so-and-so is not here, so-and-so not here. The supervisor is not here. It was the State Bank of Pakistan in those days. Yes. I do still vividly remember the building in London. Anyway, so after four weeks, they lingered on and uh, uh, each time uh, I went, uh, he was making some excuses. So I was so fed up because I had no money left 
to, you know, um, um, anywhere to live any longer in the city because I had to pay rent and I had to uh, pay for my uh, every day meals. So I was really worried. And uh, I could see there when I went there, there was a room which was uh, written, uh, supervisor who was the supervisor or the manager of that department. So I went to see him and uh, outside the door, there was a uh, person, what they call gay, you know. Yes. And he said, uh, who do you want to see? I said, I want to see the South Big Shaw. He said, have you got an appointment? I said, no. He said, you can't see. Have you got any card, this card? I said, no, why not? <laughs> anyway, I, being young, and uh, I, I just opened the door. I pushed him aside and went in the room. I could see, uh, again, a man. It was, I think it was a Cindy because the, the, the way he spoke was uh, a very long beard. And appeared to be you know, a religious type of person. He said, what do you want? Why are you here? And I said, sir, I applied for five pound made application four or five weeks ago, and still they are not deciding about this application. So he said, why do you think that they are not um, approving your application? So I, spontaneously, I had to say, I don't know why, but I said, well, Perhaps they expect some kind of bribery, uh, and I haven't got the money to pay any bribes. Instead of helping me, I remember, he said, oh, you're accusing my department of being corrupt. <laughs> I said, sir, no, I'm not saying that. I think there's no other reason I could conceive of. Yes. He said, get out of my office. So uh, this uh, man outside, he rang the bell, he came and he said, kick me out of my office. I don't see it. Anymore. So when I went away from that building, I still remember I was very upset and very angry. I was crying because I was hope, you know, yes. hopeless. So after a week, I came and I said to that clerk, I said, it's, uh, I'm sorry if I, you know, uh, made any, if I said something which offended you and your boss. Yes. But I need this five pound. I still remember it's uh, what he said. He said, okay, come here. He said, he got blank piece of paper from his uh, door. He said, write it down what I would dictate. I said, okay, so I still remember those words. They were uh, ingrained in my mind. He said, you say, main apni galti par nadam hu. I apologize on what I had said or something like that. And he said, you got to sign. I signed. And uh, he gave me those five pounds or whatever he sanctioned. Uh, yeah. paper. And he said, the other thing that he said, I asked, you know, it's, 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 uh, uh, that made me really think um, about what I saw. He said, people, Rebels like you, Pakistan doesn't need them. Yeah. You go away from this country, and never come back. <laughs> they, they, their losses are again. <laughs> Those words are still echoing. Yeah. You know, resonate. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I see some kind of people being maltreated, even there are here, I could not tolerate. I cannot tolerate. When I even go back to Pakistan, I see all these kind of uh, social and uh, 
other injustices, discrimination, inequalities. It makes me, it makes me not mad, but it makes me think, uh, you know, why I can't do anything for these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, tell us about Nottingham, coming to Nottingham. Nottingham, I can, I remember coming from the um, Victoria uh, Terminal to St. Pancras. Um, I still remember that I caught a taxi. I paid half a crown. And from St. Pancras, I got a ticket and uh, it was extremely cold. It was a month of, I remember the date was 23rd of November. It was foggy. It was cold. I had a very thin two-piece suit. And uh, I managed to get a cup of chocolate from the vending machine, yeah. put some pencils, and waited for the train to uh, come to the platform. Then it came, then I got into the train. In those days, I mean, trains were not like nowadays. And yeah. I mean, nowadays, heating is perfect. And uh, I was virtually trembling, or I was shivering. And when I sat there, then um, five minutes later, um, a gentleman came, uh, well dressed on his uh, hat and everything, and uh, quite professional, quite old, well educated. He uh, sat next to me and he said, Are you cold? I said, Yes, sir. And he said, When I can't help you. The train will get heated when it moves, not before that in those days. And mm -hmm. they use the heater on underneath the seat. And he said, you don't know, but I'll put it on for you. But he said, meanwhile, I, I know that you got um, um, shivering with cold. He got up and um, he opened his um, small suitcase, which he was carrying in those days. And he got a small blanket and uh, he said cover it with this blanket and you'll be okay. That was the first uh, experience uh, of mine uh, of kindness from someone, a stranger in mm. Britain, the first day. So we then chatted uh, for about one and a half hour and the train uh, stopped at Nottingham he came out uh, to the platform and he said goodbye. He gave me his card, this thing card, and said, if you want a job, I'm a farmer, I can give you this job. But I live in Derby, I don't live in uh, Nottingham. I said, okay. So then I went to my friend's house and um, uh, I think it was like two weeks after I got his job, first job, in, um, in um, the toilet soap manufacturer was, um, in those days. Um, and um, uh, I got a job on the machine which produced cloth cubes. And because they um, gave me a test, you know, if I could. Uh, write English and so on and so forth. So I could speak and read and write up, and not in this proper accent, but I, I, I managed. And I worked there for about six months. But then again, I had ex first experience of uh, racism. Uh, someone treated me very badly. And I said, Well, I'm not your dog, I'm a human being. So he said, uh, uh, go home. We don't need you. So I went home. <laughs> so, um, then I went to work on British Rail in Nottingham. Um, then to uh, textile, uh, large uh, mill in Derby. And during all this uh, time, I was then I went on to buses and doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was much involved in social and welfare uh, work and uh, in anti-racist campaigns and uh, um, 
in those days, you know, the, there used to be large, large protests against yes. uh, this immigration policy, but so yes. forth. Yes. And we formed, with the help of our friends, I think that some of the educated friends, we formed their uh, organization, which is called Pakistan Friends League, yes. uh, that provided advice, help, and assistance to, uh, in those days, to illiterate uh, Kashmiris and Pakistanis on uh, weekends, uh, Saturday, Sunday, free of charge. And then I moved to become quite active in trade unions there. Oh, the, the interfaith kind of uh, 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 activities, which even in those days, um, uh, we started in Nottingham between the Christian uh, church, between the church and the, and the Muslim community. Yes. I uh, remember going to schools, uh, giving talk on Islam, uh, and sometimes churches used to invite me, and we used to have sort of discussion about Islam and Christianity, and so on and so forth. I became much involved in the issue of uh, race relations, community relations. I then was appointed as the uh, member of the conciliation committee of the uh, first legislations uh, board it was established i think in 1968 then in 1969 i think i got a job uh, in the uh, nottingham community relations council as a housing officer it was a project which was financed by the banking foundation uh, to help immigrants with the housing problem. Uh, mainly in, in those days, uh, there was a strong uh, uh, Afro-Caribbean community. Uh, and uh, I worked for two years, uh, three years, I think. Uh, I did do a small research with the uh, uh, help from the uh, local university. And uh, a, a small uh, book was published uh, about uh, the issues uh, affecting the Blacks and Asians uh, in the area or in the field of housing. And uh, <clears throat> then I was invited to Tower Hamlet, I remember, uh, to give talk on the uh, problems of uh, housing. <laughs> And uh, there, um, although I knew him, I met uh, Reverend Peter Hutchinson. He was uh, also a uh, co-speaker. Yes. And uh, after that small um, day conference ended, uh, I knew him because I was also involved in the legislations. And he was uh, in those days, uh, you know, before um, he, he, was, uh, he came to work Bradford, he was working in Birmingham as a community relations officer, right? right. And he was quite well known, very outspoken on the issue of uh, uh, multiculturalism. So he's, he said, Ajay, why? Uh, I mean, let's go together. I'll give you a lift to Nottingham. It's on my way. I said, uh, about the return ticket. Oh, he said, you can get a refund. That's a bit of jazz. I said, okay. So he gave me lift to uh, Hatford. And during this uh, uh, journey from London to Nottingham, he said, I have listened today your contribution, to your contribution, and uh, you very seem to be very much interested in housing and race issues and this and that. And you have a community of yours in Blackford, it's very deep lies and housing conditions very, very bad there of uh, this particular community. Why don't you come to Blackwood? I said, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, can't. But he said, well, whenever you visit next time, Blackwood, let me know and um, who you'll talk to. And so I came to Blackwood. Uh, he took me around. Uh, on the day trip I came, he took me around the areas of uh, the uh, settlements of uh, Kashmiris and Pakistanis mainly. And yeah. I could see very poor housing in those days, back to back houses, no basic amenities. People were living really, not only substandard houses, really, you know, in 
ولی how can I say I mean worst housing conditions compared to um, some other cities uh, even uh, in uh, with the I compare with Nottingham. Yes. I said it's a big. He said it's a challenge. I said I know. I said let me discuss with my family wife. When I went back, I said that uh, I I think I need to do something about that whole housing condition. So that actually then um, influenced me to come to Bradford on the invitation of Reverend Peter Hutchinson, a great advocate of racial equality and multiculturalism. And this project for which he uh, was at that time director, and I was appointed as an assistant. Um, it was a shelters project, the national campaign of the homeless. Um, but they had obtained specific or uh, special funds from again the Good Banking Foundation. And it was an experimental uh, project. Uh, it was called SHARE, Shelter Housing and Renewal Experiment. So I worked there for about seven, eight years. Okay. And then I came to Redwood. Then I got involved very much in the local community relations councils. I was uh, chairman for some eight years. I developed the organization to a very high profile. Then, you know, it was well known at the national level what we did achieve. Of the very critical, uh, often of the role of the local authority and the other institutions, the building societies, the uh, lending institutions of the banks and this and that. So uh, eventually, I, I think that I decided to go into politics because I realized that shouting from outside does have some impact on the thinking and the policies of the establishment that I wanted to be a party to the decision-making process. So I uh, contested for selection in 1979, I think, yeah. Yes. And then I, I, I uh, uh, became a very uh, active councillor. At the same time, I was uh, still chairman of the Community Relations Council and the director of uh, shelter housing uh, program. And, uh, because I wore three hats, um, different hats, I think that it, 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 it gave me the opportunity to make comment on, on all these issues, the race issue, the housing issue, the multiculturalism. And the first, I think, challenge was the um, busing of uh, fuel in those days. Yes, yes. We used to have dispersal policy and I opposed it. Um, I, my stance was, my argument was, and still is, uh, still no, no regrets. I said it's a discriminatory policy. I'm all for integration, but it should be a two way traffic. I wanted to see the white children from the suburban areas coming and attending some of the schools in the inner city areas. And the inner city area, from inner city areas, the children of immigrants uh, should attend the freedom to dominically the schools in the white areas. The council decided that. It's, it must be only one way yes. the immigrants should be moved. And that I thought, it was my political argument was that then uh, the inner city schools won't get improved. Yes. Uh, and uh, I oppose it very vehemently being on the council and then I threatened to take them to the racial uh, equality Commission and the council. I think there were two authorities. Ealing first, 
uh, got disbanded, uh, dis uh, dismantled, this commission left followed. And then the big issue, uh, there are so many issues, but I'm just mentioning the most important issue. The, we had a campaign for the probably the Falal meals in our school, all mm -hmm. children. That was uh, quite a big issue. Uh, it took about uh, 18 months. Uh, the, it was a newly established council of mosques in those days. And, uh, they, they were very um, uh, much in the forefront, but uh, uh, we were only about two or three councillors in those days in the council, but I provided them political support and uh, we were yeah. together. Yeah. And eventually uh, we got through uh, this uh, <clears throat> big hurdle and the council agreed and the Bradford became pioneer uh, in this <clears throat> respect. Yeah. And the example was followed by many, many other schools in the country. Yeah. Like, uh, then, of course, the big issue was Rushdie affairs, and that was the watershed as well as the race relations and the Muslim community was concerned. Um, and then, obviously, when I became the Lord Mayor uh, in 1985, the uh, big problem uh, at that time, which arose during my tenure in the office, was of a headmaster of the uh, secondary school, uh, Ray Honeyford, who wrote certain articles um, in the regional and the national uh, papers, including, I think, the Time uh, Education Supplement. But I think that one of his articles, then after that, he wrote in the Salisbury Review, a very yeah. right wing uh, journal uh, in those days, still, I think, like this. In that he deliberately uh, he, he 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 put the argument that he was trying to see uh, the process of integration being expedited by um, the children becoming anglicized and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but the the way, I mean, or the language he used in that article, in my view, was designed to denigrate certain ethnic minority communities, and particularly Muslims, even Sikhs and the Black community. Yes. A very provocative language. I thought it was a racist language. Uh, uh, the protests held by the Parents Association um, I could see the both sides, the, the people from the National Front side, one side, the community and the liberals on the other side. Um, and, uh, uh, I could see the feelings was running very high. Yes. I thought that uh, there was a possibility of uh, uh, getting the city involved in uh, race rights and violence. So I made the call one day that uh, he should resign um, because I could not see my city being tarnished uh, um, for the sake of just one man. And, uh, uh, that actually, uh, to my not really surprise, but I didn't expect the extent of uh, hostile reaction and in the next few days, uh, uh, I received the deluge of uh, initially uh, abusive letters. Yes. Uh, my family was threatened. I was threatened. Uh, they said they would kidnap my family, burn my family. The police came. They provided all the protection, this and that. So that was a big issue which I had to uh, deal during the uh, uh, my tenure. Uh, uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, yes, I, think, I think normally um, the position of Lord Mayor is uh, Mayor and Lord Mayor is a symbolic um, uh, bit of a non non political cutting ribbons and um, making appearances, uh, just saying a few words. Um, 
you you were quite rare in that position uh, in that you spoke your mind and um, you also spoke up uh, politically and and the Honeyford affair uh, was one one such thing um, and um, the other thing that I, I think from that era, uh, there was a book written ab about the Honeyford affair. Uh, I, I have a copy. Um, and in, in the book, um, you were quoted uh, saying, and it was a debate about uh, Muslim schools. And there were members of the Bradford Muslim community wanting separate Muslim schools. And you were opposed to that. And uh, you, you were quoted as saying, I don't want separatism in any form. It is not on. People can't have it even if they want it. What we want is accommodation of our cultural needs, especially in the education system. I think that that has been my belief from the very outset uh, of my involvement in politics and uh, the race issue, I am totally against any form of uh, segregation, uh, whether it's based on religion, race, or other considerations. And um, I am one of those uh, who have spoken uh, up from time to time, even uh, when I see the minority communities, including the Muslim community, when they were in wrong, or when they were wrong, or when they, they, were, they were not sort of uh, uh, considering the long-term effects of their um, occurrences. Uh, this was in those days, some people, there were few people who were in favor of having separate Schools. I said, no, you can't have them. Um, it's our own country now. We've got to move forward. But we've got to sort of interact with each other. Uh, in those days, we were talking about multiculturalism, and probably that's the reason I use the word of accommodation of our culture. Um, because what I was saying, I was saying to the white community, well, look, you have to accept us now. Um, as we equal member of this society, because we're here to stay, we're not going back. And at that this, at the same time, I was telling the Muslims, but well, look, if this is open, you've got to make some adjustments. And um, uh, we have to ask for some kind of accommodation of our cultural values, essential cultural values, but you can't say that you want separate everything, separate everything, separate, because uh, no, no, I said that will be suicidal uh, thinking or policy of the, the Muslim community collectively. So yes, I've been critical of some of the thinking of the Muslim community too. It's not that I, I haven't all the time agreed uh, with some of the uh, issues where probably I was, uh, I was, uh, from time to time, I was probably threatened that uh, they would support me politically, but I, I could not. No, I always said what I thought was right, and uh, in my mind, or what I thought that would be um, better uh, for Britain and for Muslim community. I'm a person who have struggled the whole of my life to build bridges, to remove uh, misunderstanding, to allay fears. Uh, after all, uh, prejudice is prejudgment and you uh, prejudging people you don't know. I mean, I have friends amongst Christians, uh, very good friends from the last 40 years, 50 years. I have Hindu friends, I have Sikh friends, I have uh, Jew friends from all community. And with some modesty, I can say that after my retirement about 20 years ago, there are some people who still talk about that what I did was right. Yes. I criticized Belair, even my own leader, 
when I was deputy leader uh, and uh, the Iraqi war uh, started, uh, I said, he made the wrong decision. I said, what's the difference between you and Saddam Hussein? You're both murderers. Yes. At that time, there was so much uh, cacophony in the newspapers and headlines. And they said, I should have been careful not using uh, this kind of language. And, uh, with, yeah. But I said, the history will tell you that I, what I said was right. And the history has proved. And now, last week or two, three weeks ago, I see he has apologized that it was wrong. Yeah. So the point I'm making that I have never been afraid of not saying something which I thought was right, irrespective of the consequences. Well, um, I mean, many people said that, oh, my name was, I think, recommended by about 20 MPs uh, for the upper house, the House of Lords. And uh, someone said, well, how can you expect Blair to uh, accept your name? And I said, right. so why should I? I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> Those, you know, I don't want to sort of, I'm not uh, bothered at all. So I think it's honesty. Uh, it's, it's, it's something which I can't, I can't, I can't sort of do. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, invite some audience participation. Uh, yeah. Before I do that, and um, in case uh, some people need to leave, um, uh, I, I just want to mention um, um, the, the new book. You've had many articles and programs made and books written. Um, the, the book you mentioned earlier um, that Yakub Nazami had put together when you became a mayor, um, yeah. uh, I often read it for my uh, if, if if nothing else, I read it uh, to uh, practice my Urdu, um, and uh, it's one of my favorite books. And um, uh, most recently, there's been another book that um, uh, has been published, um, and um, it it was uh, put together by Ishtiak um, Ahmed Yakub Nizami, Zafar Tanvir, and Dr. Dogra, and uh, it had. Um, many people from across the faith and eth ethnic communities writing in it. The foreword was written by Bishop of Bradford, Toby Howarth. And I, um, it, it is a book that is uh, currently available. And um, I would recommend it, uh, that book. It, in fact, it was the book that actually started all this idea of having this evening. And so I, I, I recommend that book. And um, so I'm now going to hand it hand over to Phil um, to um, pick up some questions, Phil, um, from the audience. Yeah, and, and Karama, thank you. Thank you. And do look at some of the questions as well. And you, you pick up as well. So we could take it in turns. So um, there was a question about, um, well, there's, there's lots of questions actually, um, but one about, I'm actually gonna be very naughty and start with me. Oh, yeah, good idea. Because I can't find any, any other ones at the moment, but Moh uh, Moh Mohandas Gandhi was once asked what he thought about Western civilization. And he replied, I think it would be a very good idea. And I, I, you've lived in the majority of your life in England. And um, I mean, you've encountered so-called Western civilization. I'm actually wondering what you've missed most about Pakistan and Pakistani culture and what can UK learn from Pakistani society in the way of life uh, there and, and here, because a lot of people have brought it with them. But what there's gaps in our society what can what can britain learn from pakistan i left pakistan 60 years ago i still do visit uh, after my retirement from time to time because i was born and i lived 
in that society for 16 years, those formative years. I do remember some of the values, but those values have been eroded even in Pakistan. Uh, I think that there was very strong family unit. Um, there was the concept of extended family, the mutual support to each other, and that continued to be practiced here. Uh, but so I believe the world is changing. It changes every minute, and the change is the most permanent feature in life of human beings. And we have to embrace some changes. All changes are not bad. And I have been a person who have always advocated that there are some good cultural, religious, and social values mm -hmm. uh, within certain immigrant communities, including Pakistani communities, Kashmiri communities. But at the same time, British society is not all fraught with all the ills and all the bad values. There are some extremely good values which we have to adopt. So it's a kind of reciprocal acceptance and accommodation rather than saying that one culture is superior, the other one is inferior. I don't believe in the concept of inferiority or superiority, whether you are discussing culture, you're discussing race, or you're discussing any other aspect of life. And the world is becoming smaller and smaller. It's, it uh, is shrinking. And we, we can't live in isolation and say, we know what's happening uh, mm. anywhere in the world, and it takes only a few seconds now. Mm. So what I'm saying is this, yes, Pakistani culture and the religion there, which is Islam, they offer some of the uh, values which could be of great benefit to mm. any community. But at the same time, yeah. here, there are some values which are uh, in a way, you see them in action, in practice, rather than being used as slogans. Yeah, dunia gold hair, as they say, the world is round. Yeah. Um, Karam, you've got a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, some, somebody um, uh, has posted a um, uh, situation of women. Uh, Ajib Saab, um, I remember not too long ago in a Facebook post, you quoted Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, uh, with the words to the effect of, no nation can rise to the height of glory unless your women are not side by side with you. What progress do you think we still need to make on that front? in our yes. Pakistani community in the UK? I think in Britain, uh, Pakistani and Kashmiri community, I think that we, in many cases, we are going through third generation. And I remember in early 70s and early 60s, when the family joined their bread winners here uh, in UK, those women who came from Pakistan or Kashmir, mainly they were from the rural areas, uh, uneducated, and they could not speak the language. There was a problem of communication. And for all those other reasons, there's no time to discuss uh, all those reasons, but Pakistani community educationally is still lagging behind many other uh, ethnic minority communities like even, you know, the Bangladeshi, Indians, and so in Afro-Caribbeans, and so on and so forth. Women were uh, lagging uh, more behind than men, because in the, in the village culture, I mean, they left there. I mean, there were no educational facilities available. 
there were some Orthodox Muslim families who did not want their uh, uh, female uh, uh, offsprings to, 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 to go into school. But here, I think it, the, it's, it's all changing now. I see some of young Muslim girls who are becoming professional. They're moving into the area of education in Bradford, for instance, there are so many teachers. Uh, there are some solicitors. There are other women who are in business. So gradually, gradually, I think that uh, the, 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 uh, uh, there is uh, uh, an acceptance by the community uh, as a whole that the woman education is very important because as they say, that if, if one woman in the family is educated, then uh, it's not only that that family, but the whole nation um, can benefit from it. Uh, the, uh, some of the hindrances and obstacles, I think that they are now no longer there. Uh, I mean, there was a time when Muslim community here in Britain, and particularly in Bradford, um, they wanted only send their uh, girls to girls uh, only schools, but now I mean I've got three daughters. They're all educated. Um, one is a solicitor. She's also a local counselor. One is teacher. Other one is manager. Uh, so my personal view is I'm. Uh, I, I have fought all sorts of equalities. I have been fighting against inequalities, and that includes gender inequalities. Yes. Uh, and I say it openly, I and mean, people might criticize me, they say that I've been influenced by the Western liberal values, but I, 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 I don't agree with that uh, kind of uh, allegation or accusation or misunderstanding. Islam does not forbid women to get education. And if Kaide Azam, their leader in Pakistan, who founder of Pakistan, and they revere him, then why don't they act upon his advice? And that was one of the reasons I put that as uh, his saying uh, on my post, that to look, the father of your nation says, that without women being educated and taking part in all aspects of life, you cannot reach the desired um, uh, progress. Yes. I have a question here from uh, one of our uh, women participants, um, yep. from Serena, saying, you said you used to question inequalities and justice even when young. What areas are still placed on your heart to see improvements and change? And do you have any tips for peacemaking? I think that inequality, even, I mean, it's a wide area. I believe that inequalities do exist in all countries, in all aspects of life whether we are talking about social justice, so social inequality, uh, economic inequalities, educational inequalities, gender inequalities, race inequalities, all these equalities do exist. But there are people in this world who have continuously made efforts and their struggles uh, are on record in history. And as a result of uh, all these uh, individuals and organizations which are engaged in promoting equalities, in promoting social justice, in promoting racial justice, I think that there is, the, the, the life is becoming uh, a little bit more pleasant and uh, happy. And uh, I do hope that it will continue to uh, improve the situation in coming years. Uh, 
it is not it's not a question of the, we can dissolve all these um, inequalities uh, uh, overnight. Uh, it's, it's a perpetual kind of struggle. Um, and the perpetual efforts, I think, uh, must uh, continue uh, by those who believe uh, uh, firmly in, in, in the ideals of uh, equalities. Equality, yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm personally, I'm an optimistic person. I'm optimist. I'm not a pessimist. I, 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 I know there are very big challenges, uh, uh, but I, I never, I'm not one of those who say, well, there's not going to be, you know, a better life tomorrow. Right. Um... Phil, can I can I ask a question um, about our multicultural society? Yeah. Um, we, I think we we've probably forever been multicultural, but certainly in terms of visible multiculturalism, it's been since the Second World War, um, uh, and when Rush uh, uh, arrived in in the late forties, Pakistanis have been coming. Uh, before um, uh, Pakistan came into being, but certainly uh, 1950s in the days uh, you arrived, um, and then the Mangla Dam uh, brought uh, additional people, and Pakistanis are now the second largest um, uh, community, certainly in schools, and there are we have a number of other uh, minorities. Uh, how well do you? would you say we as a society um, have done multiculturalism? Could we do it any better? Um, what are the issues and problems uh, with it? Uh, what improvements could we still make? We haven't done as much as we could have done. Uh, I think there are historical reasons. Um, Western Europe, in particular, uh, first time began to experience the immigration from their ex-colonies uh, of people with different religions, with different cultures, with different uh, racial backgrounds, with different ethnic backgrounds, and with different colors. Uh, it was not an easy experience for Europeans to go through and accommodate and accept uh, these minorities uh, as equal citizens. At the same time, the people who thought to come to their ex imperial masters countries, they felt the first waves, the first generation, they were very submissive. They were very sort of uh, everything they did but very meekly submitted to, to, to the whims and to, to, to the, the superiority complex of the uh, Europeans. But gradually, I think that now after 50, 60 years, the people in Europe are beginning now to realize and acknowledge the irreversible historical fact that these people are here to stay and they're not going back. Yes. And now the threat which in the first 20, 30 years um, was perceived by the white population about, uh, uh, from these uh, newcomers is gradually veering out because of the better understanding of our interaction which have been taking place over the years now. Multiculturalism has been 
the major political issue in Britain or in France or in Western countries. Uh, I'll tell you why. I remember in 70s and 80s, multiculturalism became a vogue for many sociologists and many politicians. Oh, yes, 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 multiculturalism. And then uh, after Rushdie fell, and particularly after 9 11, uh, in Britain, the political hierarchy uh, totally rejected the concept of multiculturalism. The Racial Equality Commission chairman, what was his Trevor Philip, he openly said that that policy has failed because he got this indication uh, from the top politicians. And the problem here is in, in, in Europe that it's, it's the politicians, some political parties who destroy the work of people uh, committed to promote uh, multiculturalism, better understanding between people of different religions, races, and this and that, then there comes a bombshell in the form of one statement prior to the election, which actually destroys everything. Mm. So I have always called for some kind of sanity within the political system and the political parties that for God's sake, don't use the race card at every election. Because after four or five years, what some people like yourselves, and there are many, many others who try to mend the relationship between different communities, then someone comes and they say, well, that's not on. Um, it's uh, multiculturalism and even race issues. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's totally politicized. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you see, I someone came to see me after 9 11, I think uh, it was about 2005 or something, and journalist, and he said, What do you think being a Muslim now? Uh, in this country, how do you feel? Yes. I said that when I came to this country in 1958, we were all blacks. Politically, we were described blacks. I said in the 70s, I became an Asian. In 80s, I became a Muslim. And now in 2005, I'm a terrorist. The problem is it's the majority which accords the status to minorities and what sort of perception it creates about that particular minority within the host or within the indigenous society, indigenous population. Yes. And that has been the biggest problem in a way of uh, achieving some of the goals in the area of multiculturalism. But Again, I'm not pessimist. I always say Britain has irreversibly now become a multiracial, multi-faith, a multicolor society. Whether we like it or not, it's going to be the fact now. And the sooner we acknowledge this, the better will it be for all of us. Thank you. Um, in, a, in a few minutes, we're going to um, open up and yeah. give unmute everyone. But before we do that, I just want to read uh, something from the first book that I had uh, written, um, compiled by Yakub Nizami. I was actually given a copy by Mahmoud Hashmi. Yeah. And I want to read, and this is in Urdu. So yeah. my apologies to my English friends here. Um, so I'm going to read in Urdu. Yeah. It says, Lakin ye kena galt hoga ke ajeeb saab ne Lord Mayor bankar hume sirf Lord Mayor banne ki targheeb di thi. 
حقیقت یہ ہے کہ ان کے ان کی مثال سے ہمیں یہ سبق ملتا ہے کہ اگر جذبہ دل صادق اور ارادے میں پختگی ہو تو آخری منزل صرف لارڈ میئر کا چیمبر ہی نہیں بلکہ یعنی کوچس اقبال ستاروں سے آگے جہاں اور بھی ہیں عجیب صاحب کے اعزاز نے ہمیں بھی معزز بنا دیا ہم میں خود اعتمادی پیدا کی اور ہمیں یہ شعور دیا کہ اپنی دلچسپی اور شوق کے مطابق ہم اپنی منزل کا تعین کر کے اسے حاصل کر بھی سکتے ہیں شکریہ عجیب صاحب بہت بہت شکریہ کہ آپ نے ہمیں راہ دکھائی سو ان سمری آئی ووڈ لائک ٹو سی تھینک یو سر فرام دا ہول کمیونٹی وائٹ بلیک ایوری ون وی سلوٹ یو Thank you very much indeed. It's been my pleasure and privilege to uh, have been invited to your program. Okay, over to you, uh, Phil. Yeah, I'm, what I'm going to do, if that's okay, is just for a little while. We've enjoyed so much having uh, this conversation, but I know there's a number of people, Mohammed Ajib, who are friends of yours, who know you and want to say hello. So what yeah. I'll do is I'll, I will unmute everyone and yeah. then we'll have a little Tamasha for a few minutes, a little um, gub shop, some chat and an opportunity for people to, to say hello. And then just uh, I just say, uh, leave when you must. You've come when you can and now you leave when you must. So let me, I think everyone's unmuted, are they? No, let me unmute everyone. Uh, I think we have to, no, I think I have to ask you to unmute. So please feel free to unmute. And then just say, bring your greetings. Sorry if you wrote a question, we weren't able to include it. But... I just want to say, Ajeev Sahib, Assalamu Alaikum. My name is Dr. Zafar Iqbal. I was in the 90s in Bradford. It's very nice to listen to you again. And talk to you. Are you at Ma- Dr. Madison or? No, sir. Well, if you remember, there used to be this organization called Taro. Yes. yes, yes. I was the chief executive of that. Oh, I see. Nice to and see you. You yeah, visited some of the uh, Chef of the Year awards as the main guest. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I remember mm-hmm. that. Yes. And yes. Then, uh, is in Woking and he's yeah. very much part of Woking People of Faith. And he's a man with the vision for the Peace Garden in Woking and uh, has been very, made a huge contribution to that. Yeah. So you've Ajib Sahib, uh, I know personally two people from uh-huh. this uh, group. Uh, Ishtiaq Ahmed Sahib, whom I met in uh, early 80s when I first arrived from Pakistan in Bradford. Uh-huh. Just to mention a little about uh, Yaqub Nizami. Uh, yeah. He was my class fellow at Bradford College. We studied together until 1984. Uh, now I live and work in Oldham. Nice to see you, Al. Uh, nice to see you. Actually, Nizami, Yaqub Nizami. Yaqub Nizami, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've known him for many years. <clears throat> when I was uh, uh, managing a project, uh, the Council of Masks, I remember, in uh, 86, 85, uh, to train youngsters uh, for jobs. And uh, he was one of the uh, trainees amongst those. Uh, yeah, I think uh, he worked there as an advice worker. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I'm glad to say that uh, nearly 90% of those youngsters which I trained, they all uh, subsequently uh, got uh, good jobs and uh, they are moved up the ladder now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, are you, which area are you in now? Uh, uh, are you in Oldham? Oldham, yeah. Nice, nice to see you again. Uh, I've seen the name from Derby. I actually lived a while uh, and worked mm-hmm. there about 20 years in Derby, with Derby Shard Library Service. Oh, well, I see. Yes, I, I know some people from Derby because I lived in Nottingham for 15 years before I mm-hmm. uh, moved to Blackfield, I think, 1970. Yeah. 
I remember mm. uh, actually uh, there was a Bradford supplement published by Daily Young in London, oh. yeah. uh, 1984. And uh, I actually used abstract about your life experience in Bradford that time in uh, Facebook. Yes, I a couple of months ago. There have been, there have been so many sort of, uh, yeah, uh, newspapers and journalists uh, uh, published some articles about me. Uh, some of them are still uh, that in my files, but most of them I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Ishtiak Ahmed has actually been very polite and put his hand up. So maybe you should say what you want to say, Ishtiak. Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, all I need to say is that. Hello, Thank you very much. All I need to say is that I, I have known Mahmoud Aji from uh, 1978. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, he has been my mentor, he has been my guide. Uh, I'm perhaps one person who has benefit, benefited most from his wisdom. Uh, and, and he is the one who set me on uh, route to equality and struggle for equality and social justice, uh, which I have been engaged throughout my, my, my life. Uh, and uh, I have been absolutely uh, grateful uh, to, 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 to uh, Allah Almighty uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to contribute not one on one occasion, but two occasions. So the very first book, uh, which from which uh, uh, Gramad Iqbal read the extracts in Urdu, uh, I actually also contributed a, a small piece in English, uh, trying to recognize and acknowledge uh, what enormous contribution Ajib had made. Uh, that was 1985, and then I was I had a privilege now uh, to be able to contribute to a second more comprehensive. Uh, book which looks at his life uh, is something. Uh, he, he's been an enormous influence on me. He's been an enormous influence on, 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 on many, many people in Bradford and elsewhere. We are just absolutely grateful. Uh, and I'm very grateful to Allah Almighty for, for giving me health, courage, wisdom, and his presence uh, for, for all of us. Uh, may he live long and may we continue to benefit from it. Thank you. I, can I, uh, I have to, I must say that, uh, you know, Ishtiak is not only my friend. I always have regarded him as my younger brother. Mm -hmm. And he is also uh, put on record that he has also made enormous uh, contribution uh, to uh, interfaith, uh, issues uh, and also the legislation issues. He's been um, a beacon of hope in Bradford. So what he's been able to do over the years now, recently he has decided to retire. But he, like me, I'm sure he will not retire. Uh, uh, he will continue. Um, because some of us who have uh, been uh, busily engaged and very active in our whole life on some of the issues which uh, have been and still are very close to our hearts. We can't simply um, give up. We, 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 we can't leave the community uh, here in Bradford um, alone. We will continue and he is one of those. Um, I, I mean, I can't describe in words that, uh, uh, about his contribution. Uh, he uh, has been the man mover and the initiator of this book, which uh, Kramat was referring to recently, uh, compiled uh, and printed. Um, he, I think that <coughs> as I live, I would be happy to continue to work with him. Hello. Hello. Did you want to say Hi. something, Zarina, there? Oh, I was just going to say thanks for having me. And I was encouraged to hear about your bridge building work throughout your life, how it had stemmed since childhood. And for me, what struck me was your underpinning values and how you used to question even when you were young. And um, yet you always looked 
um, at not separatism, but learning from one another. And very much your story spoke about interfaith and interrelations with others. And for me, that can only seek to inspire and drive me. And um, I'm happy to have joined you tonight, sir. Thank you. I think that my, I think the grammar did probably, I think he, he probably wanted to ask me a question that um, if I had another opportunity to come back from the next world <laughs> to this <laughs> world, <laughs> who, second chance. What, what I would do. <laughs> and uh, I think this uh, young lady had just reminded me of that question and then um, the answer probably I would have given. I, I think that I want, I, I would probably continue still if I uh, have another life with my current mission of um, promoting peace, harmony, equality, uh, non-violent kind of world where we all human beings could live together in peace and harmony irrespective of of a religious uh, background, racial or national uh, background. First thing I think uh, I have great value to is the humanity. Uh, we are all human beings. We might have different colors, different religion, different social values, different traits. That doesn't mean that uh, we have different blood. All of us have. Uh, red blood, uh, mm. no one has white blood, black blood, pink blood, or, or um, of any other color. Uh, it might take a long time, but there, if there is a hope, uh, I think that the there's a, well, there's a hope or whatever they say that. But sir, ha sir, having spoken to some of our young people locally in Woking, I believe that there is a drive for peace and understanding of one another through some of our young people who can be real ambassadors. And I would hope that they would pioneer some of the things that they've recently shared during lessons. And that was a session as a response to racism when I asked as a Christian if I would be welcome at their Muslim table. And the answer as the girl broke down in tears was, you wouldn't have been welcome at my father and mother's table, but auntie, you are very welcome at mine. I think that we, a person like me always now at this age, uh, depend on young people like yourselves. Um, it's, um, it's the world is now in your hands, and I think that you can try your best to shape it uh, based on your beliefs, uh, philosophy, and principles, uh, which are obviously uh, mine. Are that I want to see this world uh, becoming more peaceful and tolerant, uh, and uh, we hope. Uh, nations should learn to live in peace and harmony together. I mean, I can't understand all these conflicts with conflicts which are unnecessary and unwarranted, but human greed, avarice, and the, um, the desire for uh, had money and uh, subjugation, it, it still could be one of the uh, two of the basic instincts of human being, but we can suppress them, we can eliminate them if we try, if we are committed, if we are honest and not hypocritical. I think, we, if you don't mind, I think we need to finish. Um, I think uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful event. Bari Mirbani Janab. Wonderful to um, hear you and and hear your wisdom, and we're delighted that you've been able to share. This has been recorded, and it will be shared, and a link will be sent to you all, so you can watch it with your heart's content or share it with friends of yours as well. 
Okay. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Karamat, for organizing it. Do you want to say anything about uh, anything in the future or any ideas that people might have? My, my thinking is that um, um, we, we've done three of these conversations. Um, I, I'm mindful that all of them have been men. Um, so I'm lining up one or two women um, particularly Pakistani women um, and um, about their lives and their struggles. Um, so uh, I think uh, it takes time to research and prepare uh, these uh, sessions. So um, it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to learn even more uh, about Ajib Sab's life um, while I've been preparing uh, because I've referred to many uh, published items, uh, YouTube videos, books, and so on. And I was thinking, uh, as a learner, uh, uh, I have done my PhD already. If I was to um, do a second PhD, I would probably want to do it on Ajib Sab's life. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it's it's been a wonderful opportunity to learn more um, about him and uh, his life and uh, one day when I write my book on the British Kashmiris um, uh, he will be very much part of that and uh, the book from Istiak and others uh, the recent book that I recommended um, is, is a tremendous uh, uh, material, material uh, tremendous source so uh, thank you, Ajib Sab, and uh, thank you to everyone who, who is still here. Um, thank you for your time. I yeah. gotta say thank yeah. you very much, Ramad Bhai. I think you have been wonderful. Yeah. And I have been reading some of your, your posts and uh, the, the the things which you have sent to me about your, I think, book about uh, taxi drivers and the racism and so on and so forth. I think you are doing tremendous um, work. Uh, to promote uh, human understanding. Uh, and that's what we need, human understandings. I mean, we are all human, but we may be different in terms of our faith, race, color. That shouldn't matter. I think that tolerance, tolerance, mutual respect. 